I want to bring in Elon Trowin for more. He is a Brandeis University professor and an Israeli historian. The violence in Israel also, though deeply personal to him, his daughter and son-in-law were killed in their home by Hamas militants. Professor, thank you very much for joining us, of course, on something so difficult. We are so sorry for your loss, and we appreciate you being with us this morning. Obviously, you're dealing with this unimaginable grief. Again, such a personal part of this tragedy. First, we'd just love to hear from you and give you the opportunity to just tell us about your daughter, what you want us to know about Deborah and your son-in-law, Shlomi. They were a beautiful couple. Both of them are musicians. They were teachers. They ensured that their children in the elementary grades went to a joint Jewish Arab school so that the classes mm -hmm. were conducted both in Arabic and in Hebrew with the idea in their own perspective that since we live in a fractious area, that it'd be important that people learn each other's languages and mm -hmm. cultures so that they might be able to find the means to accommodate to one another and live together. And it was to that, and Shlomi, my son-in-law, actually taught in the school for a good many years, a school called Hagar, named for Abraham's first wife and the one who was considered to be not favored. It was a way of saying, we will privilege those who think they're not favored here, and we will give them priority mm -hmm. because we seek accommodation. So that's the couple who mm -hmm. lost their lives at, in part they saved their son's life, a 16-year-old boy, by throwing their, lot, their bodies on him as the Hamas came, used explosives to break through the doors to their home, and then used explosives to break through their so-called safe room. And um, then came back time after time to uh, see if they had killed everybody in the house. And when they weren't satisfied, they lit the house of a fire, as they did all the other houses in the neighborhood, expecting that if they were a survivor, that that survivor would run out and then they could mm -hmm. shoot him. These were people who came bent on murder. And uh, they succeeded to have such a significant extent that in this house right now, we also live in the negative. The siblings and the surviving children are together discussing how and where they're going to bury their parents mm. because it can't be done in the community in which they made their home because it's still a war zone. Mm. So where does one go? And how does one arrange that? Um, there are so many, <clears throat> so many corpses that have been assembled. Some are unidentified. Um, our kids have given their DNA so and they, they know where their parents are. But extracting them from the mass and bringing them to a community or a place where it is appropriate for them to be buried is a problem. These mm -hmm. are the kinds of issues that children, and I might say parents, should never have to face. But that's going on, and that's because we are suffering through a pogrom. Now, it's because of pogroms in Eastern Europe that my parents and grandparents came to the United States of America. Never did we believe that that kind of experience would replicate itself here and that our grandchildren would encounter that as an experience of life. Mm -hmm. So there's frustration, there's anger, there's not hate. We recognize this is not Islam. We recognize that this is a variant stream, a wild, a wild weed, if you like, that has attacked all kinds of people based upon their identity and their and their faith. And that's what a pogrom is. A pogrom is not a military action between one military against another. It's when people with arms go against innocent civilians and attack them because of their difference, their difference in faith and difference in identity. So we know that Hamas is not the entire Arab world. But we know that's the part we have to deal with. We're thrilled, as my kids wanted to believe that we could find accommodation. The, the Abraham Accords, the, the relationships with Morocco, the possibility of Saudi Arabia, the fact in the university, Ben Gurion University, where I've taught for decades, that there are Arabs who are heads of departments, that 50% of the people studying pharmacy in Israel are Arab. 20 plus percent of the students at our MIT, the Technion, are Arabs. 
that my, my daughter learned Arabic as a pediatric oncologist at Hadassah Hospital because she wanted to serve the students who were coming, the patients who were coming from across the border wow. and to live in the Arab communities of Israel. We came here to live in peace, and instead we get the same kind of fundamental anti-Semitic hostility which still exists in this part of the world and is directed to Christians, to Jews, and to people who do not belong to the community that wishes to ascend to power. Professor there are Trowin, probably um, fewer, let me just finish, yeah. there are probably fewer Christians in the Middle East today than there were a century ago. Almost all the Jewish communities a century ago have been uprooted, and they were here for 2,000 plus years. So I just wanted to make clear that anger is not directed against the Arab world. It is not directed at people who have a different faith. It is directed against the people who behave in this outrageous way and those who would support them. Mm. Sorry. Professor, Professor Elon Tron, thank you so much. Your, your expertise in this area is so appreciated this morning. And of course, we are so sorry for your loss. And we appreciate you sharing a little bit about your family with us. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.